ಭೌಮಜ್ಞಾನತಿಮರನ್ನಸ್ಯಾಜ್ಞಾನಂಜನಾಶಲಾಖಾ ಚಕ್ಷೂರುನ್ಮಿಲಿತೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀಗುರುವೇ ನಮಃ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ಇಸ್ಕಾನ್ ಆಫ್ ಸಿಲಿಕನ್ ವ್ಯಾಲಿ ವೇರ್ ಆಬ್ವಿಯಸ್ಲಿ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಎಟ್ ಅವರ್ ನ್ಯೂ ಟೈಮ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಡೇ ದಟ್ ವೀವ್ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ಅ ಫೋರ್ ಕ್ಲಾಕ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಸೊ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಆಲ್ ಫಾರ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ವೇರ್ ಹೋಪಿಂಗ್ ಟು make this transition smooth and that it will accommodate more of the devotees and the services here. Thanks everyone for joining us online from various places around the world. And as those of you who are here at the temple can see that this is a, a preparation time. There are, there are many devotees in the parking lot getting ready there are lights going up getting ready for janmashtami this is the most important festival here every year it will be on friday starting early in the morning and going till midnight and then the next day will be the, the vyasa puja for his divine grace ac bhaktivedanta swami prabhupada the founder charya of viscon and in order to accommodate the more than 10,000 people that come here for janmashtami as you can see they may not fit in the temple hall all at one time or do you think we could do that <laughs> we have a we have a plan to accommodate everybody that's being well thought out and has been in the planning stage for months actually in cooperation with the city and all the permit departments and so forth it's as an onerous task actually getting everything together and uh the devotees are joyfully engaged so there's a lot of extra energy here today with devotees cooking and preparing everything outside for the festival and here inside there seems to be a bit of calm everyone's here looks calm and ready to discuss philosophy and chant hari krishna am i correct about that yes, yes. so today we're going to have a look at the bhagavad gita which is always a good idea feel free to express yourself uh, it's always a good idea to look at the bhagavad gita and hear what krishna's directions are as shrila prabhupada points out in a purport to the second second canto second chapter verse number 15 that the bhagavad gita is itself vedic intelligence i may have a, a modicum of intelligence but it's not sufficient to see my way through the various complications that this life presents but if if one follows the vedic intelligence that is krishna's intelligence because krishna says in the bhagavad gita sarvasya cham ham hridi sani vishto mataksmiti gyana mapohanam cha vedaish cha sarvara ham eva vedyo vedanta krit veda vedeva cha ham he is the author of the vedas he knows the vedas and the purpose of the vedas is to understand him so it's a great boon for us that he spoke the bhagavad gita to arjuna in fact in shri chaitanya mahaprabhu's teachings to sanatan goswami he says that krishna speaking the bhagavad gita to arjuna has saved the whole world and this is so because the concise vedic teachings we find otherwise known as the gita upanishad which really means a summary of all the upanishads is there in the bhagavad gita and today we'll look at one of the verses from the 18th chapter in which krishna talks about the way in which there are five factors to every action that we take although we are doers we have free will and we have choices to make still we're dependent on other factors and especially what shilap robert calls the super cause for the enactment of any action or for any action to be successful So I first offer my respectful obeisances to his divine grace AC Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada 
who is the founder of Charya of ISKCON, and I offer my obeisances to all of you because you are Vaishnavas and therefore are the most worshipable in the three worlds. So in the, in the 18th chapter, Krishna describes the perfection of renunciation. And although that may sound a little daunting, because and nowadays people aren't accustomed to renouncing and giving up all the th comforts of life. In fact, every suburban home is built for comfort. There's air conditioning and a place to park the car, which is also air conditioned. So practically you can leave your air conditioned house and get an air conditioned car. You have instant indoor plumbing, so you don't actually have to leave. There's refrigeration for foodstuffs, cook inside. Everyone lives a lifestyle that's actually more accommodating than uh, ancient kings used to live. Although they had all kinds of servants. They, they didn't have every kind of spice they'd ever ask for, could ever ask for. And they also didn't have Amazon Prime, which meant that you can get anything you want at any time. So what is the meaning of renunciation in, in such a, an atmosphere? There's a way in which Krishna describes how one should develop an attitude that whatever I'm doing is f for Krishna. And actually, I should consider that the work I've been given to do in my life is meant as an offering for the Supreme. And if one thinks like this, oh, one can actually be a renunciate even as one's working in the world. Of course, Krishna also says in the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, which means that you have a right to perform your work. And at the same time, you shouldn't be attached to the results of your work. And he also says, does Krishna, that you shouldn't be attached to not doing your duty. So that's an interesting statement, isn't it? People might then think, well, why would I work if I don't claim the fruits of my work? Well, first of all, it's important to consider that we can't really enjoy all the fruits of our work anyway. The Prophet used to point out that no matter how much money you make, you can only eat a certain amount. True? Yes. Like, if your quota is four japatis, and I'm sorry if you're from South India, I'll say... Um, Italy or dosa, and maybe you can eat one dosa compared to four japatis. I don't know how they, what the equivalents are, but we could do a scientific study and find out. But in any case, if you can eat four japatis, if you make a billion dollars, it doesn't mean you can eat five japatis. You can still only eat four japatis. And there's a limitation to how much one can actually enjoy material facility anyway, because Everyone is endowed with a particular set of senses that can accommodate a certain amount of material enjoyment. And the news from the Shastra is you're not going to enjoy more than that, and also you're not going to enjoy less than that. In fact, Narada Muni, in his instructions to Srila Vyasadeva and to all of us, and that means that there's no need to try extra hard to accommodate yourself here in the material world so that you'll get extra happiness and avoid distress. What do you think the reason he gives is? It's compared to something like um, genetics. You, you're born with a, with, with a certain genetic code that's going to determine a lot about your physical appearance and the way your body works and so forth. On the material side, he's saying that you're going to get a certain set of circumstances Meaning, just in general terms, a certain amount of happiness and a certain amount of distress is destined to come your way. And he gives this logical argument. 
And that is that, well, first of all, let me ask you, have you ever done anything to ward off misery? Or do you pray that you can have a miserable day sometimes? What is the answer? I need help here. A little participation. Yes. We always try to ward off misery, says Kanka. In what ways do people try to ward off misery? Yes, Balaram? By buying stuff. How do you know all these things, Balaram? <laughs> By buying stuff. This is called retail therapy. I don't feel good, so I go buy more stuff. Um, what are other ways people try to ward off distress? Supplements. Yeah, they buy lots of supplements. You can go through the internet, and then there'll be a little advertising saying this will prolong your life. It's a proprietary formula, which means we're not going to tell you what's in it. And it'll cost you $69.99. That is if you buy a three-month supply. And do people buy it? Yes. How's their thinking? It'll prolong my life. I'll be happier and so forth. People also, in Japan, every... Every temple we go to, they sell outside in the gift shop these little talismans. One of them you can hang on the some of one of the protruding parts of the of your car because it means that you won't get in an accident if you keep that talisman. It's been blessed. Anybody here ever do a car puja? <laughs> What's that about? Uh, you don't. Just uh, you know, hope that your car gets hit. You hope it doesn't get hit, and so forth. But does your car ever get hit? Yeah. Okay. So this is Narada Muni's point. He said, no matter how hard you try to ward off distress, uh, it comes anyway of its own accord. But there's a balancing point to that, and that is, even if you don't ask for it, happiness will come also. It'll come of its own accord. That's what he's saying. Just, he said, look at how hard you try to ward off distress, and it comes anyway, right? So then he says, well, happiness is there on the ledger also. It's going to come of its own accord. So you could save yourself some time. You don't have to work so hard to try to invite it. You may do due, due diligence to make sure that you don't crash your car when you lock it at night, but you don't have to become overly concerned with positioning yourself in the material world to get more happiness and to ward off all distress because that's already fixed up to some degree. However, he does say that it's important to, to use your free will to choose yajna or sacrifice for God so that you can actually make advancement spiritually. And that's where you can really apply yourself. And so one of the ways that one can do that is to work for Krishna. And that means that whatever work you're doing, if you dedicate it to the Supreme, what do you think some of the ways of dedicating your work to the Supreme might be? That are really tangible. Yes? Sponsoring a kalash. That's really close to home, and we didn't ask him to say that. By the way, we have Kalashas where we're going to be doing an Abhishek for the Supreme Personality of Godhead on Janmashtami, and they are available right now. Is that right, Aprame? <laughs> yeah, so if you, if you use your money as a, a way to do something for Krishna, this is actually a kind of... Um, investment in your spiritual advancement. What other ways might you uh, dedicate your work to Krishna? Really what he was saying is you're giving some of the fruit away. I'm sorry? Bhagavad Gita 927. Is that an enigmatic suggestion, or you want to uh, unpack it? And if so, could somebody please give Vijay Dhamana Prabhu a microphone? Thank you. So just reading out. So just get it to the verse, Maharaj, that Yat Karosi. Yat Karosi Yat Astasi Yat Juhosi Dadasi Yat Yat Apasasi Kaunteya Tat Karosh Mat Arpadam. 
So all of these are offerings. Whatever okay, he's referring to this verse, and you'll see before you the English. Krishna suggests, whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you offer or give away, and whatever austerities you perform, do that, O son of Kunti, as an offering to me. So whatever you're doing in your life, including your work, if you dedicate it to Krishna. So I'm asking for tangible ways in which you might demonstrably offer your work to, to Krishna. What is your suggestion? Well, um, look at the practical things that we, our life is revolving around. One is obviously our jobs. So whatever we get out of that, if we make sure we take the minimum and everything else, we keep it in Krishna's pocket. And whatever we do need to do, because we have to live our life, even that is an offering to Krishna. For example, if I eat, whatever energy I get, then I spend that on Krishna. Then if I get some accolades out of that, then I give that back to Krishna. So it's a never-ending cycle, and it's like a Fibonacci series. It keeps on and on and on. So something like that is possible. <laughs> what? Okay. Yes, Mukarvin. Thank you, Vijay Jamana Prabhu. Um, Maharaj, like practical activity, um, suppose you are a good web designer, you are, a, you are like whatever your works, like you are a good manager, you can use the same skills in Krishna service, like temple needs some management, temple needs some activities that you can, um, you can practically volunteer for your work that you might be skilled or, or not just... Yes. And I was just listening last night and this morning to some memories that devotees had of Srila Prabhupada when they first met him. And some of them described, for instance, Prajumna Prabhu and his wife described how when they first met Srila Prabhupada, he asked them uh, what their skill set was, and then he immediately engaged them. Um, it, one of the devotees is named Ambarish. He's a uh, grandson of Henry Ford. So Prabhupada engaged him right away in some service by bringing him around to a lot of the programs where he was talking to large groups of people. And then, although Ambarish said he didn't even understand what Prabhupada was saying because he was speaking in Hindi, he'd then say Ambarish, and then Ambarish would stand up and Prabhupada would point out that he's the grandson of Henry Ford. And he took that as a nice service that he was able to, <laughs> to be shown off like that. And, and also, Prabhupada found uh, the Fisher Mansion in Detroit and wanted it to, and he wanted to develop it into a cultural center. So he asked uh, Ambarish if he would purchase it. And, uh, and he did. So, uh, so he engaged him in, in some service. And others who came forward and met Prabhupada immediately, he would ask them if they would do something. For instance, if they were already working, then he asked them if they would contribute some of their time or their talent. Like Prajumna, as I mentioned, was a uh, very is a, a very smart person, and Prabhupada engaged him in helping to edit his books and to translate Sanskrit verses and things because he learned Sanskrit very quickly. So everyone got some engagement, and that's one of the ways in which to connect to uh, to Krishna is to use your talent for some kind of seva, some service. So uh, there are different um, motivations for service. And can you turn, first of all, I want to introduce the verse to you that Krishna speaks in the 18th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Tell us what verse number. For the five factors of action. There it is. Panchaitani Mahabaho. Karanani Nibodhami. Sankhe Kratante Proktani. Siddhaye Sarvakarmanam. And the translation is for those O oh, mighty armed Arjuna, according to the Vedanta, there are five causes for the accomplishment of all action. Now learn of these from me. And here's the Prophet's purport. A question may be raised that since any activity performed must have some reaction. How is it that the person in Krishna consciousness does not suffer or enjoy the reactions of work? The Lord is citing Vedanta philosophy to show how this is possible. He says that there are five causes for all activities, and for success in all activity, one should consider these five causes. Sankhya means the stock of knowledge, and Vedanta is the final stock of knowledge accepted by all leading acharyas. Even 
Even Shankara accepts Vedanta Sutra as such. Therefore, such authority should be consulted. The ultimate control is invested in the Supersoul, as it is stated in the Bhagavad Gita, Sarvasya Chahamrudi Sanivishta. He is engaging everyone in certain activities by reminding him of his past actions. And Krishna conscious acts done under his direction from within yield no reaction either in this life or after death. This is a great secret of work, as Krishna points out in the Bhagavad Gita earlier, that one who can see action in inaction and inaction in action is wise amongst people. Because there's a way to work in the world, to uh, have things, to be in a material body with all kinds of um, complex circumstances, but to adjust one's attitude in using those things so that one is not encumbered by them or entangled, as is the usual case. The, the term samsara, who's familiar with this? Samsara? Samsara really means the process, which sometimes it's described as the process of birth and death. And it means that once I leave one material body, I get another material body, but the reason I get another material circumstance is because of what, the way I left the last body and the consciousness that I developed over a lifetime. And Krishna consciousness indicates that the real perfection of life is throughout this one lifetime as much as possible to develop a, an awareness of Krishna, our dependence on him, our uh, develop our love for him, and to change our motive for work. And there are various uh, kinds of motivations. Some of them will implicate us more in material consciousness, and others, that is, as we've been discussing, thinking about doing the, whatever we do for Krishna will bring us to transcendental consciousness. And this samsara is described by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur to be like chain smoking. Have you ever seen a chain smoker? None of you? Yes, yes. Okay. Do they have chain smokers in India? They do? They do that there? Well, here's how you do it. <laughs> you get a cigarette and you light it. At some point, you have to start the first one. And then... Before the cigarette finishes, you pull a, a fresh cigarette from the pack. You put that in your mouth, and then you light the fresh cigarette with the one that's already practically burned to the bottom. In this way, you never have to be without a cigarette. So, Srila Bhakti Sinanta said that the process of taking one body, giving it up, and taking another body is like chain smoking. So now consider the fact that you're burning this body up right now at 98.6, which is pretty hot. We're burning through this corporeal body, and when it's finished, because of my desire to stay absorbed in material thoughts and activities, I'll accept another one, which is like starting another cigarette before the other one's finished. Your new body gets determined before you even give up the old one by momentum. So this chain smoking process is not very healthy. Either in smoking cigarettes, it's a sure way to ruin one's health. And similarly, spiritual health is destroyed by remaining addicted to work and being the cause of work and enjoying the fruit of work. Therefore, one should give up smoking altogether and take to the process of thinking of oneself as a servant of Krishna and giving the results to Krishna, then one can be clean and healthy in life, no longer implicated in the karmic reactions of work, and uh, one develops a kind of uh, spiritual freedom. So there are various motives for working, and I would like to list some of them for your consideration. So, one of the motives is fear. 
So if we act out of fear, then we're sure to make mistakes. And in fact, even when a motive is considered in a legal case, if someone gave some evidence based on fear, for instance, they were under duress because the interviewer told them that I'm going to break your fingers if you don't tell me something. And, and then they say whatever they say, and then it's not really considered evidence because they were under duress and, and fear. So if I'm implicated in the cycle of work and being attached to material things, the Srimad Bhagavatam says, Bhayam dvitiya abhini besha tasyad, ishad api tasya viparya yosmiti that this is the cause of fear, being absorbed just in working for uh, maintaining myself and sustaining a comfortable life in the material world. This is called a binibeshat, or being absorbed in material life, and this is a cause for fear. So naturally, when I'm motivated by fear, I'm going to make a lot of uh, bad choices. And it's, it's not a very comfortable position to be in, right? Say yes. Okay, three people said yes. yes. Okay, so above fear is a prospect. Prospect means that, and it's very usual in this world, but that people move and they're motivated. Motivation means movement. It means why do I move? Why do I bother to get up in the morning in the first place? And if I'm motivated by prospect, which means profit, means what do I get out of this? personally. This is very usual. This is how most people move in the world, even animals. They're, they get up because uh, they're hungry or they're in debt and they want to do something to alleviate that. And so they're looking for some kind of tit for tat. This is compared to uh, paid content. They want something in return. So that's another kind of motivation. Would you agree? that that would be a highly motivating factor in this world. Yes? Yes. Thank you. The next above that is duty. How many of you here have ever had a hard choice to make and then you did your duty? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. <laughs> Very good. You did your duty and this uh, doing of duty is considered to be good. In fact, you'll find oftentimes in movies or literature, drama, someone who is dutiful is considered well in society's eyes because they rose above their own personal prospect as a motive for activity and they did something that was good for everybody because they did their duty. And that's a uh, uh, kind of a heroic thing to do, actually. But really, in the ultimate end, duty means you did what you were supposed to do, not what you wanted to do. Does that sound accurate to you? Thank you. I'm getting a lot of support over here from the pundit circle. And then finally, and this list is given by Bhaktivinoda Thakur, the highest motivation is out of love. And this motivation, you could say that he didn't have to do it, but he did it anyway. And that was because of a sense of deep gratitude or love for, for the object of service a person was serving. So there are various ways in which we may be motivated, and the highest motivation is to First of all, the higher rungs of, of motivation, as we have all discussed here so far and agreed upon, are duty. This uh, relate to dharma, the meaning that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, even though if it doesn't feel very comfortable, sometimes I do it anyway. And then above that is that I have gratitude, and I've developed a love, appreciation for the Supreme Personality of God and His devotees. I have a sense that Krishna's maintaining me. He's actually my best friend. And Krishna says this in the Bhagavad Gita, where he says, Suridam Sarvabhutanam, I'm the friend, the best friend of all living entities. The Vedas say, Nityo Nityanam, Chaitanas Chaitananam, 
Eko Bahunam Yovidati Kaman. That the Supreme Personality of God is the one who's sustaining everybody else. Every ant here in Mountain View right now, whether he or she knows it or not, and they probably don't, is being sustained by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Would you agree? They're getting all kinds of facility. Nice ground to build a house, housing projects below the earth, free without any permit considerations, and lots of real estate for ants here in Mountain View, plus tons of food. It just gets naturally distributed to the ants. They find it here, there, and everywhere. But the Vedas say that's coming from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But to speak of everybody else, the squirrels are having a feast here in California around this time of year, plums, peaches, and they just find them on the trees and they eat. And human beings, yes, this is a point made again and again by the Vedas. If you see how elephants are getting tons of food every day, because they have to eat a lot to maintain their large bodies, but it's supplied. Ants, they get enough to satisfy them. So why wouldn't a human being get a special facility if one is careful to notice that we're getting all these kinds of facilities, one might start to develop a kind of gratitude. And this is something that Shukadeva Goswami points out at the beginning of the Srimad Bhagavatam to his disciple Parikshit Maharaj. He said, take a look at the universe and see how charitable it is. There are all kinds of trees providing fruit and shade and wood, and there are mountains with streams. There are places that are uh, provided naturally here in, in the world that are sustaining. I want to speak of the fact that these very bodies are being maintained for us. Digestion, homeostasis, all these things take place automatically as a facility given to us. And where is it coming from? It's coming from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So if one is able to become more aware, beyond even duty, that I have an appreciation for the fact that I'm, I'm being given, given facility at every second by the Supreme Personality of Godhead uh, to be alive. My very consciousness is coming from him. And as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Ishvara Sarva Bhutanam Hridashara Junatishtati Brahmanyan Sarva Bhutani Yantra Rudrani Mayaya As I travel around on the car of this body, uh, Krishna, who is the Ishvara within the heart, is supplying intelligence to help us to fulfill our desires. And he fulfills any of our desires whether he thinks it's a good idea or not, because he remains neutral. So now, in this section of the Bhagavad Gita, it's mentioned that with the facility of various factors, including the senses that we've been given, the intelligence that we're provided, we may desire whatever we like. And ultimately, through these various factors uh, culminating in the supreme cause, or the super cause, which is the super soul within our hearts, who ultimately orchestrates everything to fulfill our desire, uh, we can go wherever we like, we can develop in whatever, whichever way we wish. And to that end, in the Gita, Krishna says, Yanti Deva Vrata Devan, Pitran Yanti Pratir Vrata, Bhutan Yanti Bhuteja, Yanti Mam Yajinopi Mam, which basically means He's telling Arjuna that we can go wherever we like if we put our mind to it because uh, Krishna will fulfill our desires through the various agencies of the material world. Now, um, we receive a, a certain kind of uh, facility in this world based on our past karma and uh, the momentum that we have coming into this life, but it doesn't mean that we're stuck with it. In the present day, there's a lot of scientific study into epigenetics, now called behavioral epigenetics. And it points out that although we have a genetic code, naturally, 
when we get this body. That it doesn't necessarily mean that the genetic, the genetics we've uh, been born with will uh, determine everything about what happens to us health-wise, longevity-wise, and so forth, because a lot of it depends on how we, we behave ourselves. If we change our behavior, we're finding out, then the genetic code may not act the way it was set up in the beginning. So in a, in a similar way, although we have a destiny from our last life, based on what we've already done, we have a certain set of karma, as I was describing before, and that may sound uh, fatalistic, that why do anything? Because it's already determined. I kind of indicated something like that in the beginning. However, the, the great sages and the shastras all say that don't let this slow you down because you are a free soul. You have the same kind of independence, ultimately, that Krishna has, only in minute quantity. And you can be self-determining. So Krishna consciousness is the most mature understanding of how to work in this world out of love for God, appreciating the ways in which he's facilitating us, and more than that, that he's actually our best friend. And also it considers the scheme of the material world and how it actually works, how we interact with it makes a huge difference in the way things turn out. And ultimately, we are agents who can make a free choice to modify our life. And so modified epigenetics applies to us in the way of our, our destiny and our karma. If we modify the way we approach life, the way we think about it, our attitudes, the way we apportion the kinds of things that we're given in this world, if we do that in, in a highly uh, sophisticated or refined way, understanding uh, our position in this world, then we can actually live the, the best possible life in the human form and take full advantage of it. Ultimately, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is stated, Samsadir Haritoshanam. The real purpose of all activities, no matter what duty you've been given, no matter what kind of karma you have now, whether you may be a man or a woman or an elephant, is to please the Supreme Personality of Godhead by your activities. And that comes to the point of bhakti. Because if you learn the science of how to please Krishna through your activities, then naturally, by pleasing Krishna, you'll be happy. Because when Krishna is pleased by your loving offerings in bhakti, then you'll also uh, feel the reciprocation that Krishna gives. And again and again, Prabhupada quotes throughout his books a famous verse from the ninth chapter of the Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam Yome Bhaktya Priyachati Taraham Bhakti Paritam Ashnami Paritatmanaha. That he says, if one offers me with love and devotion a leaf of flower, fruit, or water, I'll accept it. And uh, this is a, a very intimate relationship, offering something to the Supreme Personality of God and, and having him consciously accept it based on your motivation, your gratitude to give it to him out of love. That's uh, an extremely refined way to live and to think and to act. This is bhakti. So the International Society for Christian Consciousness teaches a process through which anyone living in Silicon Valley can modify his or her life around the principles given directly by Krishna himself in the Bhagavad Gita to live a life that's uh, aligned properly through motivation and action so that one will be happy and prosperous, healthy, spiritually fit, and at the end of this life, one can give up the process of chain smoking once and for all, and go back home, back to Godhead. What do you think? You, should we try it? Okay. So there's an initial public offering on this offer 
that was made by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu just a few minutes ago, actually. It was just opened in geological time. What's 500 years anyway? It goes by in the blink of an eye. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu made this initial public offering for anyone, if you'd like to be on the ground floor of the best opportunity that's ever been offered in the history of the universe, then you can join Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement called the Sankirtan movement. So what you get basically by investing is the perfect process through which you can be connected to Krishna and you also will develop a kind of spiritual wealth because the Sankirtan movement of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was geared upon the idea that it should be given to as many people as possible. And so you're on the ground floor of what we have as insider information, this, in, uh, this initial public offering, IPO, um, is the best deal that you're ever going to get. So we're uh, really a brokerage here. And we're offering this IPO for anybody who wants to sign up. And we have ways in which that you can invest. Uh, first of all, you can invest your money. Because it ultimately, as I proved earlier, it doesn't do you that much good after a certain amount anyway. If you can eat four japatis, even if you make a billion dollars here in Silicon Valley, you can still only eat four japatis. However, if you invest it in Krishna, then just like the great personalities of the Srimad Bhagavatam, like Juva Maharaj, who was a prince and he decided to give his whole life to Krishna, even when he was five years old. Or you might remember Bali Maharaj. Do you remember Bali Maharaj? He owned everything. He had the kingdom of heaven and so forth, but he decided very consciously, even though he was given advice by his so-called spiritual master, who was a, a giving advice contrary to what Krishna would uh, say in the Bhagavad Gita, which is surrender to me, his spiritual master was telling him something materialistic. He said, well, wait a minute, if you actually surrender to Krishna, then uh, what am I going to get? <laughs> That's what he was thinking. But he told, he told Bali Maharaj, be careful, because this Vishnu, he's actually a real cheater. He'll take everything. And uh, Bali Maharaj went ahead and did it. So he's glorified, uh, it has been for eons, as a, as a great personality. Now, the, I guarantee you there's millions and billions of living entities who had lots and lots of material facility throughout their lives. And we have no idea who they were because they're not famous. You want to know why they're not famous? Only two people want to know. Everybody else, cover your ears. Okay, so here's why they are not famous. Because they kept their wealth to the bitter end. And they, you know, people found it in mattresses. They hunted down all the accounts they had them in. And they had a hard time finding where the bank account number was. They couldn't find the key to the safety deposit box. Because the person was hoarding it all. And they thought, I'll just keep it. But the, the ironical f fact is that they weren't able to keep it anyway. It was all taken away. And so the secret that these great sages know is, if you give your wealth, your life, your intelligence to Krishna, you'll become eternally famous. But if you try to hold on to these assets, then they'll be taken anyway. And you'll be unnamed, unknown, unfamous, actually even infamous, for having held on to it. Because the Shastra doesn't look well upon those who are misers. So the best idea, really, is to sign up for the Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu investment, which means connect your life to the Sankirtan movement. Give a portion of your wealth to help spread the Sankirtan movement, and you'll become not only famous, you'll feel satisfied, but also you'll find unlimited facility in this world by doing 
the sacrifice for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And you'll also never be out of a job because in the Sankirtan movement, we promise jobs, jobs, jobs for everybody. People worry oftentimes about their employment. But I guarantee you one thing. If you learn the Bhagavad Gita and you think of your main purpose in life to propagate the teachings of Bhagavad Gita, which is most of you, are, I would guess, are from India, just by looking around. <laughs> this is your birthright. You come from a land that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu described as the place in which everybody knows the basic spiritual principles. And therefore he said, Bharata Bhumite Hoyla Manasa Janma Jar, Janma Sarta Kari Para Upakar. He said, therefore it's your duty to do good for others as much as possible. Use your God-given intelligence, which is considerable, and use whatever uh, means, wealth, uh, energy you have to help do good for others. And the best that you can do for others is not buy them clothes. Heavens, there's enough clothes in the world. People are throwing them away. They buy clothes, they put them on the hanger, they wear them once, and then they ship them back to some place where they're recycled and then shipped back here again. Uh, people are not satisfied when you feed them necessarily because they just get hungry again. But what people are starving for is spiritual knowledge, especially from an authoritative source, something that's actionable, and that's the Bhagavad Gita. So, Sign up for Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's program and you'll have the best deal that you've ever had. And then finally, the, what the most important process of bhakti is the way in which we um, fix our minds. As the mind has to have a satisfactory place to uh, give its attention. And there's been unlimited research. Now, you may just have to accept this, but you can do the research yourself. But the fact is that great saints, sages, and incarnations of God have given detailed information about the best place to place your attention. Because that may be a quandary. Where should I th uh, give my attention throughout the day and throughout my life? What's, what object can I look at? What one thing can I concentrate upon and get the highest return on my uh, attention? And the, the conclusion might surprise you, but it's actually to fix your mind on the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Bhagavan. If you think of Krishna and meditate on Krishna, then as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Ananyas chintayantamam ye jana if you absorb your mind in thinking of Krishna, he says, thinking of me, then, he said, I'll just personally take care of you. And you'll f always feel uh, blissful and happy by doing this. Now, there is a very practical way to do this. And it is the uh, chanting of the Hare Krishna Ma Mantra. This is an open prayer. It's a prayer that is uh, actually meant for the whole world. Anyone can partake in it. It's written in the vocative form. And it, it has 16 words, 32 syllables. This you can meditate on every day as a kind of a, a open prayer. You can do it uh, by sitting and repeating it. Or you can sing it in a group, and you'll get the, the best result of all the bhakti processes from chanting. And the mantra goes like this. Please repeat after me. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Hare Hare. And uh, wherever this mantra is chanted, people uh, become happy. As, of course, some people become angry and they run away. But that's natural. Um, People become happy, and they get the mantra stuck in their head, and they walk around telling their friends, I just heard the Hare Krishnas, and I can't stop thinking of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Sometimes they say the mantra wrong. There was a, a guy who was doing uh, video 
work down in Los Angeles, and he just happened to video the Los Angeles Rathiatra, and at the end, he said, I can't get this mantra out of my head. What am I going to do now? So that's a good thing. This mantra itself is non different from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So he's lucky he got it stuck in his head. Don't worry about getting all kinds of other things uh, stuck in your head. If you put the Maha Mantra in, it'll push the other things out gradually. So this fulfills uh, Krishna's instruction in the Bhagavad Gita, Manmana Bhava Mat Bhakto, just think of me. So if you chant Hare Krishna, and you align your work with Krishna, give the fruit of your work as much as possible to help spread the Sankirtan movement, and organize your life around this principle of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement, then you'll be happy and everything will be successful. Okay? Om Tat Sat. Now, this is a new timing. We thank everybody for coming during the new time. We adjusted it to, to uh, make things more seamless. And I think that we have another few minutes left, right? like a half an hour. Five minutes only? 5.30. 5.30, okay. So, uh, first of all, who, who here has a question they'd like to ask to clarify anything that we've said so far? Yes, Prabhu. Now, we're going to pass you the mic as quickly as possible so that everyone can hear you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhuji, for such a wonderful lecture. Um, can you please more explain about the motives that we talk, that uh, fear, prospect, duty, and love, how we can employ these motives uh, in our uh, bhakti-like day-to-day life? Because... Uh, yeah, we can barely hear you. Hold it close. Um, the motives, the fear, prospect, duty, and love, how we can employ in our uh, day-to-day life, bhakti-like mainly by association. We develop the same kind of motivation that, that we, of the, those we associate with. And you can see this very clearly in the story of the Brihat Bhagavatamrita, of a, of a devotee, fledgling devotee at first, uh, called Gopa Kumar. And it tells us his journey, his spiritual journey. Wherever he went, he met people who he considered to be following uh, some spiritual practices and he moved in with them and started associating and he would develop the same kind of kinds of motivations and practices that they had and uh, then sooner or later he would get some outside help to remind him that actually there's a there's something a little better than that so through uh, first of all aligning oneself properly in good association, and also hearing regularly from the Bhagavad Gita. Because Krishna again and again reminds us of what is the most refined kind of motivation. And you'll read throughout the Gita that, for instance, your determination, which has a lot to do with how you're motivated, is really affected by the three modes of material nature. And all the other things that we do. And he describes the science of association by adjusting our association to, to those who are highly motivated, or I should say motivated by higher principles. Then we start to take on those qualities too and develop them. Are there any other questions? Yes. Prabhu Hare Krishna. Prabhu, it's like a very basic question. Maybe you must have answered many times. We give $100 <laughs> for every basic question that's been answered many times. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but I have to see if I have 100 with Yeah, them. but I'm very no. curious to know that why is it so easy for mind to get carried away? I understand that Japa is very important and many do morning Japa, you know, especially in the morning, 6 o'clock, in Brahm Bhumat, Brahm Murat, you know, I, I feel that you do feel very blissful because I mean, after chanting for many years, I feel that I have delivered taste for chanting and I do feel very nice and very blissful. But the moment the problem comes in life, why does it's very easy for mind to get carried away for the emotional thing? Why we don't we, even we have good hearing or good chanting, but still why does it stay for a longer time? Why does it go away so soon? 
Well, <clears throat> first of all, it's the nature of the mind. The mind tends to be chunchula. And it's also important to continue taking medicine even when you think the disease is finished. And if a doctor gives you antibiotics, he or she will tell you the same thing. Say, here's 12 days worth of antibiotics. Even if you feel better on day six, don't stop taking them. You have to take the full course, right? Yes. Doctors, any doctors in here? Yes. Say yes. Patients, <laughs> patients, <laughs> doctors, you know. So in a similar way, as long as we have a mind and a body, we have to be uh, attentive and continue the process of, of chanting Hare Krishna. And when big tests come and we seem to be disturbed in mind, then we'll have a recourse. Once we develop a taste for, for chanting, even when we become very disturbed by something, we'll know where to take refuge. Most people don't. In fact, I remember growing up, I used to see movies and television shows, whenever anything bad would happen, people always ended up in the bar. <laughs> you know, that's like a Hollywood stereotype. Something bad happens and they go like, I need some whiskey. And that's like the worst thing that you can do is just take shelter of intoxication or something else. But devotees actually learn how to take shelter of Krishna even when times become very hard. And you get, might get tests throughout your lifetime. But you're a very accomplished person. Have you had tests when you were in school? Did they test you? Yes, I do. Yeah. Were, were any of them really hard? Yeah, What they was were the hard hardest one you ever took? Was it the SATs? <laughs> not the SAT, I'm not from here, I'm from India. Well, what did they give you in, the, in India, the equivalent? Especially What's the doing hardest my master's, test? Doing my master's very hard. Yeah, it's hard, right? Do you wish they just gave you like a one a question test, like what's your name? <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, that would really prepare you for the professional world, right? Like you go in for the interview, it's like, do you know anything about quantum physics? And I was like, I just know my name. <laughs> So Krishna knows that we're, we're actually capable of so much more. But I have a tendency to become a comfortable in a routine and take the path of the least resistance, so forth. So he's very kind, and he gives us tests. And when we're tested, we may be pushed beyond what we thought we could do. And in those cases, if we learn throughout this lifetime that the recourse is again and again to take shelter of Krishna, especially by chanting Hare Krishna, it's very practical, then we'll be able to overcome uh, harder and harder tests and we'll become more and more qualified. So you can thank Krishna every time it happens and take shelter of the Holy Name. We'll take one or two more questions. Yes. Um, you mentioned that people have uh, their karmas to go through, right? They have to live whatever, the, whatever karma they have in their lifetime. And if they have the right attitude, then they can live the best version or they can, they can uh, you know, have their karma, uh, but they can still live the best version of it, right, of their life. So would you be able to give that as an example? Would you be able to give an example from Mahabharat where someone had to suffer, but they had the right attitude? and they basically lived the best version? Well, what I was saying also was in the, in the fledgling science, the budding science of epigen behavioral, behavioral epigenetics, there's an idea that whatever genetic code we have, have doesn't necessarily have to be enacted because we might adjust our behaviors. So in a similar way, when we adjust our behavior in this lifetime, we may minimize the ways in which uh, our karma is enacted. But the best way of all is mentioned in the scripture again and again. In fact, there's a verse in the Padma Purana that says, Aprarabdha palam papdam kutam bijam palonmukam krami naiva priliyante vishnu bhakti ratatmanam. There's all different kinds of karma coming into the garden of our heart, and it's very complicated because there's seeds and there's, there are actually plants that are growing, there are plants that are pr producing fruit, and the, the cycle of karma is extremely complex. But if somebody takes to Vishnu Bhakti, serving uh, Lord Vishnu or Krishna, then that karma is eradicated. 
And Krishna takes the um, karma away. Karmani nirdahati kintu chapakti bhajam. If one's engaged in bhakti bhajan, worshiping God through loving service, then he takes away your karma. Now, why does it seem like there's still some reaction? Part of the explanation is by momentum. When you pull out a fan, it'll spin for a while, even though it doesn't have any more electricity. And it's just winding down. And as long as you don't plug it back in again, sooner or later it's going to stop. And another explanation is given in the Srimad Bhagavatam, and that is that devotees don't really have karma. They have Krishna's personal direction in their life. And whatever seeming reaction we get that's, that looks like karma is actually Krishna giving us a custom-made kind of situation that resembles karma, but is actually meant just for us so that we overcome the last vestige of attachment we have to the material world, which actually causes, the, our attachment causes us misery, so Krishna is very kindly helping to take it away. So if you live with the attitude that whatever is coming to me is a token by Krishna's mercy and that it's meant for my purification, then you'll be properly aligned with the attitude that the Bhagavatam suggests. And as being able to take the lesson, you'll be able to take the lesson from everything that happens to you and use it to become stronger in devotional service. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll take one more question. You have it? Okay. Prabhupada, this is not uh, on the chapter that you were talking today. This is about Prabhupada's book, where he actually mentions that eating meat is all right. I couldn't, um, I read it a few times, and it says the uh, same thing. Could you please expand on that? Thank you. Well, could you give a reference? Um, I have a link. I wasn't looking for it. It just came up. And he says, um, certain um, human beings can offer to uh -huh. Lord Kali uh -huh. and then have the meat. And yeah. also, certain uh, people at birth okay. can have meat. Sure. Well, um, the, the, uh, the meaning here, or the implication, or even what Srila Prabhupada articulated is not translated as it's okay to eat meat. But in the in the um, t context of wherever Prabhupada talks about offering meat to God as Kali. This is actually explaining how the Vedic process works. People start from the level that they're at right now, and they are better to regulate their senses with the kinds of habits they have now through a Vedic process and then gradually become purified. So the example Prabhupada sometimes gives about eating meat. So meat is called mangsa. So mangsa actually means uh, the mantra that you're supposed to say to the goat before you kill the goat, if you're into that kind of stuff. Um, you whisper in his little ear, excuse me, little goat, uh, I'm about to kill you, but actually <laughs> in your next life, you get to kill me. And there's a mantra that you're supposed to say, and a, and a ritual, and if somebody does that enough times, they might come to their senses, actually, that, oh, why would I do this if killing the goat means that I'm going to be killed by the goat in my next life? In other words, the Vedic rituals are meant to accommodate people uh, and their attachments and then purify them gradually. One of the ways they do that is that even if somebody's asking for some materialistic facility in this world through the uh, <coughs> karmic process listed in the Vedas, that person then sees that there's, there's a tangible result and begins to get more faith in the scripture. And as one does, one might inquire, where does the scripture come from? Who's, who's the controlling deity of the scripture? And gradually, through that process, one comes to develop faith in Ishwar. Certainly, these kinds of things are not very high-minded. Nonetheless, they're included in the huge project of the Vedas in order to accommodate people in lower modes of nature. 
so that they gradually get purification. After all, better to follow some ritualistic process mentioned in the scripture, even if it's a very low-minded type of thing, and be regulated and then gradually develop faith uh, incrementally in the Supreme Personality of Godhead than to simply act uh, wantonly or to act whimsically without any guidance. Does that give, give any help? There are regulated ways that people may do, do things like that. They're not highly recommended at all. Even um, there are all kinds of rituals through which somebody engages in sense gratification. This is the, called pravriti marg. The Shastras describe two paths. One is called pravriti marg and the other is called nivriti marg. So one is the path of enjoyment and the other is the path of giving up the world. Now, how many people here want to just completely give up the world right now? Just raise your hand because we have a table outside that's going to be <laughs> collecting all your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you want the Pravriti Marg instead of the Nivriti Marg. So on the Pravriti Marg, there's concessions. For instance, the Grahasta Ashram is a concession because actually, you know, engaging in sex and so forth is very binding to the material world, but there's a regulated way that it's done through the Vedic process so that one uh, can gradually give it up. That's what Varnashram is meant for. And there are various ways that people are addicted to eating meat. We don't just leave them. Just as, as much as any civilized government or city doesn't leave people who are addicted to opioids just to fend for themselves. Uh, the, the government and other entities are meant to offer some kind of uh, facility for the people in general so that they can improve themselves, even those who have fallen into really bad habits. And the Vedas are like that. They offer all kinds of facilities. Somebody's addicted to something, say, okay, here's where you start. There's always a big public debate that somebody uh, in a government, a government agency offers help to people who are addicted to heroin, and then everyone says, no, you're encouraging them to take heroin. I said, no, actually, <laughs> they have to start somewhere to come in and, and actually get association and information and not get uh, communicable diseases from sharing needles and so forth in order to improve themselves. So the Vedas also uh, recognize that there are people who have hit the bottom of the modes of nature and they need to be helped. So they start at a certain level and they're given certain concessions, but it's not that it's okay to eat meat. It's not a good idea at all. Does that help? Yes. Okay, okay. Thank you. So now we're actually going to try some chanting because Hare Krishna is an open prayer and you're free to chant anytime you want, anytime day or night. And it doesn't matter which room of the house you're in or you can be at the office in your car, you can chant Hare Krishna and you can even go outside and especially in America, anywhere you want pretty much, you can set up a a, a kirtan and you can broadcast it to people walking by so they can hear chant, uh, Hare Krishna and start chanting too. We just did it. When was that? Last night. Just last night. We did it down in Lytton Plaza. We got a, we got a, a, a spot down there. We've had it for the last 30 years or something. And is it 30 years? 20 years? 19? since 2001 anyway and we've been we've been going there and chanting Hare Krishna in public and uh, many people joined the chanting last night people often dance and they become mesmerized by the chanting and there's great benefit to this because if anybody hears Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Rupa Goswami one of the great teachers of bhakti says, and backed up by many shastras, that when people hear that, he says, Yadabhaso pyudyam kabalita bhava dvanta vibhavo drisham tatvandhanam apidishati bhakti pranayinim. Such a person then is able to actually get a sense for what is the love for God. They start to awaken to the process of bhakti. And if that's not a good idea, I don't know what is. I mean, there's a lot of weird stuff being offered down there on University Avenue, I'm sorry to say. This morning I went for a walk in Burlingame early in the morning and they were setting up this um, street fair where they sell all kinds of stuff. It was early in the morning, so no, none of the vendors are there. All the tents are occupying Burlingame Avenue from, I guess, the night before they fold them down. 
And I was looking and I was just thinking, how much junk is available here in the material world? And what a waste of time just walking around buying stuff that you don't need. I mean, I saw, you know, you can buy all kinds of baubles. They had things for your fingers, your toes, and <laughs> decorating this, and all kinds of weird stuff to eat and drink. And the, the soul's wandering around the universe doing all kinds of stuff that's counterproductive and doesn't even know it. It's just wasting time, basically. So when somebody like that hears uh, the powerful mantras of the Vedas, which are all consolidated into one mantra, the Hare Krishna mantra, it actually wakes up some part of them. And if they're able to then, for instance, get a Bhagavad Gita, like a lot of people did last night, and read about it and get the two things going at the same time, they can actually uh, achieve uh, a, a level in which they can start a home practice in bhakti and really make something out of their human form of life. So now we are going to have a artique ceremony which is really beautiful. It's the most beautiful thing you'll find here in Silicon Valley. Um, aesthetically pleasing, and it's a ceremony which is uh, suggested and, and authorized by the parts of the Vedas called the Pancharatra. There's a way in which the great sages like Narada Muni have gleaned from the Vedas processes which directly connect us in bhakti to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. One is the Pancharatric system, which includes uh, the worship of the form, attending to the form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The form of the Lord is absolute, so it's not that he's a representation or a statue, but he actually is the Supreme because he invests all his energy in archa, which means uh, his manifest form so that we can see him in various so-called material elements, but they're transformed into spiritual elements by his mercy. And this is an authorized process just as much as when you mail a letter, you go through an authorized process by putting the right stamp, putting it into the right box. You don't put it in any box. So when we worship Krishna, he's directly accepting our services. And the service here is chanting before him, offering prayers, and according to the the uh, Shastras, even dancing for the Supreme Personality of God, it is a kind of very uh, wonderful offering you can make for the Lord. So we're going to clear all these um, asans out of the way. We're even going to roll up this rug, and we're going to make plenty of space for everybody here to uh, offer their love to the Supreme Personality of God during the Arctic ceremony. And thank you very much, everyone who joined us here tonight. After the Arctic, there'll be a couple of quick announcements, and then there'll be prasadam for everybody, not just here, but anyone in Silicon Valley. So call your friends and tell them to get on down here as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Gaur Premanande Haribo. Nachari Armarman. Nachari Armarman. Nachari Armarman. Nachari Armarman. Hey, Nachari Armarman. Nachari Armarman. Nachari Armarman. Nachari Armarman.